Go with me in your Bible um, as we continue on the subject that we've been dealing with, with resolve to worship God. We're still at the beginning of the year, and we're working towards breakout, and I can see that God is beginning to move and have his way in our midst, in our freedom to worship God. That's what it's all about. So come on, show our worship team a little bit of love and praise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, Amen. We thank God for that. Exodus chapter 20 and um, verses 8. I just want to read that. And I want to share four things with you as a result of the text this morning that I want to walk through. Um, hopefully give us more of a reason to come together to worship God. Exodus chapter 8, verse 20. What did I say? 20, no, 20 and 8. 20 and 8, yeah. Yeah, Amen. Minister Annette is getting old. She keeps forgetting everything. Yeah. And she's messing me up over there talking about eight. Oh, you said 20. You had, to, you, had, you had it right. I know it's me. I'm getting old. Yeah. Amen. Mine is failing me. My wife's been telling me that since we got married. <laughs> Fellas, you know it. They're always remembering we're the one who's forgetting. Say amen when you're in 20 and eight. Let me read and... Um, And we're going to pray and walk through the text. Verse 8 from the ESV says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Then verse 9 says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, uh, Yahweh Elohim. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. Verse 11 tells us, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Um, Let me just, for those that this is your first Sunday, we've been dealing with the subject of pursue God and worship. And the first thing we saw in verse um, 1 through 3, God, number one, made the declaration that we should have no other God before him. So we worship him because he's God by himself, that we shouldn't create any image. Last week we saw the truth that we should not hold the name of the Lord God in vain. And today we're going to talk about the Sabbath. With me? Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Yeah, I'm guilty of breaking that one, and you too. <laughs> yeah, don't just say just the preacher, amen. Yeah, we're going to, let's pray. Holy Spirit, uh, open our hearts to hear as we walk through scriptures really quick. Uh, let me not miss anything that was ingested as we prepared this morning. Uh, open our hearts to receive, to hear, to be in tune, and convict us, God. Holy Spirit, do the convicting, because we want to worship you for who you are. As I reflected on the passage today and this week, the Sabbath reminded me of the tithe. You tell us we can have 80, just give you, I mean, 90, you tell us just give you 10. And then all you're asking for is one day. Wow. Wow. Do your work, God. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen, amen. We allow God to be God in our midst this morning. A couple of years ago, y'all remember this. Uh, well, put, I want to put the big idea on the screen first. I want y'all to see this. Um, here's the thing. Remember to keep the Sabbath holy and dedicated to God as a day of rest where we worship him. And then by reflecting on his work of redemption, keep that in your spirit as we talk through the message this morning. The Sabbath belong to God. Say it with me again. Say the Sabbath belong to God. Yeah, a couple of years ago, um, I think it was 2014, February maybe, um, the Broncos went to the Super Bowl. Y'all remember that? Yeah, don't cheer. They got that butt whipped. Yeah, they did. Yeah, that was an embarrassing moment for Denver and for all of us who lived in Colorado because our friends from all over the world called us and reminded us. Come on, don't act like they didn't. And we didn't know what to do but put our heads down and we were just all you know, um, just defeated, and, and, you know, I mean, that's for the Broncos fan. Those of us fans, we, we were cool. No, no, <laughs> but you get the idea. And, and, and we don't know, we don't know what went wrong, whether it was a sense of comfort or a sense of confidence 
or maybe it was arrogance like the uh, North Carolina fellas or, you know, whatever the situation was, but it was apparent that they didn't prepare themselves adequately for the game. And then this go round, um, they vowed never to make the same mistake again. Are you with me? I mean, maybe they weren't prepared for the big stage. I don't know what the situation was, but uh, news reporters have been reported as they prepared themselves to go into the game this time that the captains of the team call for a curfew with the team players. And they didn't want to go into the game making the same mistakes they did last year. So the whole thing was before Sunday came around, let's call a curfew. And, and some reporters uh, have, have quoted Peyton as saying he wanted a 9 o'clock curfew. Now that's an early time for a lot of young folk with a whole lot of money. You know what I mean? You, you start making that kind of money. I can do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. You ain't my mama. Don't tell me go to bed at 9 o'clock. You, you, you can see how tense that must have been in, in the locker room or in that meeting room. But the point of all of that was they wanted the players to kind of settle down and meditate and get all of the week out of their mind and just focused on that big stage, that platform, and start to study the game plan a little bit, start to reflect on some of the moves that the opponents could make and start to reflect on strategy and start to reflect on what they were about to do such that when Sunday came around, they had processed well and they were good enough to go into the game. So they called a curfew. Um, I'm learning more and more that as Christians, a lot of us have forgotten about what I'm going to refer to as the Christian curfew. And we show up to the game on Sunday morning and we can't worship well because we hadn't reflected on the game and we hadn't reflected. Come on, are you with me? And we're waiting for the worship team to prepare us when you should have called your curfew early enough the night before. Come on, talk to me. As opposed to doing what we do and all that good stuff, we should have settled down and said, I'm getting ready to go to the presence of God. Let me prepare myself. I'm old enough to remember when I wasn't mature enough to call my own curfew, mama and them Saturday night would say, you better get your clothes ready. Some of us mature people know about that. Come on, y'all. And, and baby, have you done your Sunday school lesson? Oh, come on, y'all, y'all, if you can identify with me, say amen. Come on, are you with me? Have you done your scripture verse? Have you, you know, and, and even those of us that, that were crazy enough to go hang out that night, we knew we had to come home early enough because church would go. Yeah. And if we had a little something, something on our breath, we'd brush and... <laughs> because we honored the curfew because you were good and ready to go into the presence of God. Are you with me? I think God in this text is trying to remind us of the Sabbath and preparation to go into the game of life. And a lot of us miss it because church has become commonplace and we don't take serious what God is calling us to do. And as a result, when we go to work on Monday, the enemy comes around the corner, he attacks, he sidetracks, and we end up getting defeated. We take the name of the Lord God in vain. We don't recognize who Yahweh is. Come on, say Amen. And we find ourselves being defeated all day long. Well, it's time to get back to a place where we worship God. This text that's in front of us, it reminds us of what it is God calls us to do. And it calls us on Sunday morning. And I'm using Sunday intentionally by way of Sabbath. And I'll explain in a little while. To a place of rest where we give that one day to God. Granted, every day of the week really belongs to him. But Sunday ought to be uninhibited praise. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? Just want to talk to you this morning. Come on, say amen if you're hearing me. Now, now here's the thing that I want you to understand by way of literary context. For you to really get the, the, the heart of what God is saying to the Israelites, I need you to go with me. Let's go through a couple of passages. Back up with me to the book of Exodus chapter 8. And I'm going to read and I'm going to let the text speak for itself. And Wednesday, I'm going to invite you to come out on Wednesday. We're going to dig Exodus chapter 1. I'm sorry. We're going to dig a little deeper to get into what God is saying. Because when we look at this text, we're going to find out that the Israelites were reminded to keep the Sabbath because God wanted them to dedicate that particular day to him. So go to Exodus chapter 1 and jump down to verse 8. I want to read a couple of passages of scripture just to lay, to set the context for what I want to share. 
and I'm going to let the text speak for itself. If you're in verse 8, say amen. amen. Now, here's what you need to know with this command that Jesus has given the Israelites. At the time, the Israelites found themselves in Egypt. Come on, say they were in Egypt. Now, you know they got to Egypt. I've been saying this for the, the entirety of the series by way of divine providence. God was preserving them for something unique that he wanted to do through them. So look at verse 8 of chapter 1. It says, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. I explained that. Get the podcast. You can hear this. Look at verse 9. And so he, he said to the people, behold, the people of Israel are too mighty, uh, are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Look at verse 11. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built um, for Pharaoh's store cities, Python and Ramses. Verse 12 says, but the more they were oppressed, the more the mul they multiplied, and the more they spread aboard, abroad. And the Egyptians were in fear or dread of the people of Israel, verse 13, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, okay? Don't, don't miss, I'm just going to preach from the text. Go to verse 12. Look at verse 12. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and, they, and, the, and the more they spread abroad. Let me just say this parenthetically. When trouble comes into your life, it ought to press you to a mightier place of praise, not depression. But, but when trouble comes in our life, because we don't have Sabbath, we don't know how to handle it. All right? And so the enemy sees the negative and he oppresses us. Oppression comes to make you strong. Here's how James says it. Count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you encounter what? Trials of many kind, because at the end of that, the goal of that thing is to make us stronger. So come on, challenge. It's just going to draw me closer to God. Now watch this real quick. Because, um, so it says here, and the Egyptians were in fear of the people of Israel, meaning the devil is afraid of us. So they ruthlessly, ruthlessly can't read this morning, made the people of Israel work as what? Slaves. Look at verse 14. He made their life bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And in all they, their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Go over to chapter 2 real quick. Let me show you a couple of things. Okay. That was at the end of David's life. Now understand, they were, these Israelites were in Egypt for 400 plus years. Look at verse 23 of chapter 2. Say amen if you're there. Verse 23 says... During those many days, the king of Egypt died, okay? And the people of Israel did what? Groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. And their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God saw the people of Israel and I love that last phrase. And God, what? Knew is what my translation says. Now, let me tell you the reason I like that. Because we need to understand that here's what you need to know about the text. Prior to going in Egypt, Sabbath was something that existed naturally in the life of the people of God. They naturally gave a day to God where they worshiped God and they honored him. You can read Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel setting aside time for worship. Now, here's what you need to know. They go into slavery in the land of Egypt and what the kings of Pharaoh do to prevent them from worshiping God because they were afraid of them, they ruthlessly subjected them to cruel manual labor and in essence eliminated the Sabbath from them. 24-7 work. And why was that? Because the enemy was afraid of who they were. Come on, is this making sense? So here they are in bondage and they're so busy living life that they have no time for God. And the reason they have no time for God, so to speak, is because the king of Egypt was afraid of the people of God. So he subjected them to unnecessary punishment and said to them, if I can make God a lesser priority in their life. Are you with me? 
So now, here's how the story just ended. But it says here, in, go, I want to read that one more time. I want y'all to hear me. Go to verse 23. With that background, look into this. So it says, during those many days, 23, chapter 223, the king of Egypt died. The people had grown because of their slavery. In other words, man, we were messed up here. They cried out to God. Their cry for rescue for slavery came up to God. God heard their groaning. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he saw the people of Israel, and the text says God knew, okay? Now, because God heard them, and the design of God for his people was not that they miss worshiping him or spending time with him, Moses now comes on the scene after 400 years of enslavement. God calls Moses, and he commissions Moses to go back to Israel to deliver the Israelites. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a little while. Now, the Israelites have been delivered now from, from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt. They're on their sojourn to Canaan, and now God now is starting to give them a new set of rules by which to live by. Are you with me? Okay, now go back to our text. Go back to our text. I want you to see, go to, what's it, Exodus 20 and verse 8. Let's read that now with that little bit of a literary context um, behind us. And I want you to see what God is saying to them. Okay, look at verse 8. Say amen when you're there. Notice how he begins. Now, before I even read that, when we looked at the first command, he said, I am the Lord of God, your God, don't have no other God before me. And then he goes on, don't bow them to them, this, that, and the other. But I want you to see how this command begins. It's not like an imperative to say, do this or do that. Here's what I want you to know about this particular commandment. It was a refresher of what they should have already known. So notice how he begins. Remember. A lot of us in here, like the Israelites, have forgotten and some of our other gods have taken the place of this God, of our Jehovah Jireh, or Jehovah Elohim, Yahweh Elohim. And the Sabbath doesn't mean anything to us anymore. So this morning, the Lord sent me your way just to say like he said to the Israelites after the deliverance from Egypt, remember. That word is the Hebrew word zakar. And here's what remember means. It's, it's a covenantal word because listen to how Exodus 2, 23 ended. When they cried out to God, listen to what God did. He remembered. He was reminded, and listen to the remembrance that he had, the relationship and the covenant that he entered into with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because God's brain, and I'm speaking metaphor, because God, if you know God, he never forgets. Are you with me? He was using terms so you and I could understand and we can connect with what he's saying. He remembered his covenant and he acted. So now he's saying to the Israelites, upon your deliverance, I need you to remember the covenantal relationship we have. Okay? So he says, remember this thing called the Sabbath. And, and the Sabbath from the Hebrew word Sabbat and what it means to rest or to cease or to stop. Okay? Remember this Sabbath, this particular day that I've set in place. And then he says, to keep it holy. Okay? The word Kadesh. And here's what that means. Consecrate it. Oh, you got to get what consecrate is. Yeah, yeah. See, a lot of us don't know what consecrate, you know, y'all excuse the illustration, but the only thing I can think about consecrating is I'm, I'm a guy that love um, red snapper. This, is, this illustration just came in, and, and red snapper is one of my favorite fish. And my wife went to the fish store yesterday, and then she said, um, I said, can I have my red snapper? Just like a little kid, I'm ready to eat. And she says, no, it's not ready yet. You got to consecrate it. Season it and let it sit for a while so the season can get all through. Oh, y'all not hearing me. It can get all wrapped up in it and marinated so when I cook it, you'll love me more. <laughs> Same thing God is trying to say when you get to this Sabbath. If you understand the concept of Sabbath and the curfew that I'm trying to get you to lock into your spirit, you'll set yourself down so you can consecrate yourself so I can get all up in you. I can get, come on, I can get all mixed up. I can get all up on your inside, not just in your head, but in your body and in your foot and in your hand and in your mouth and in your nose so that when I come out, the world will look at you and say, mm-mm, good. And you say, it's not me. It's nobody but God working in me. Come on, talk to me this morning. Consecrate the day, he said. Are you with me? 
This is free. A lot of us taste nasty to the word because we to the world because we miss the consecration part. We don't have Sabbath. You guys all right this morning? Remember the Sabbath, consecrate it. Now, here's what I need you to know. The reason Jesus can say, or God can say to the Israelites, remember the Sabbath, is because the Sabbath was nothing new to them. If you were to go to the book of Genesis, and we'll go here Wednesday. We don't have time to do it tonight. Genesis chapter 2, the text says, in six days God made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he what? So that principle was carried throughout. Let me jump ahead. Let me jump ahead to Exodus chapter 16. Here's what happened. You remember, this is even before verse chapter 20. They were on their way to Canaan land. And listen to this. They were hungry. They were thirsty. They would cry out to God. And you know the concept of manna, right? And here's what God would do. He would rain down manna for them. And here's what he would say. I'm only authorizing you to collect manna for six days. Because the seventh day I've got you, if you got me. And so they would go out for six days and they would collect manna. And, and he would say, only collect enough for six days. Don't try to overdose it. But the seventh day he would not rain down manna from heaven for them. Because his intention was, on the seventh day they were eating him. Not the food he provided. Oh, y'all miss that. Because a lot of us come to church on Sunday wanting to eat the food he provides, or we live life wanting to eat the food he provides, but we never spend time to ingest him. So I'm going to just give you six days' worth. Seventh, I've got you if you've got me. You guys are tracking with me? So the Sabbath, number one... It belongs to God, and we ought to consecrate it, kadesh it, or keep it holy for him. Now, let me tell you what that looks like secondly, okay? Go back to the text. Go to chapter 6. Let me just give you a quick thing on what that looks like secondly. Real simple. Look at what it says in verse 9. Say amen if you're there. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a what? Sabbath to the Lord your God. And then here's what he says. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. And then here's the rationale. Here's why he said that. Because look at how I established the pattern. In six days, it says, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is within them, and he rested on the one. Anybody in here old enough, now I know we have social service and all that stuff today, and kids have rights. <laughs> when I came up, the only right I had What's the good butt whipping if I didn't do what mom and them said? Yeah. So, so Sabbath for me was not an option. Are you with me? I think the text is trying to tell us the same thing. He's not saying don't do you, but take time to do me. I, I want you all to hear me, okay? And, 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 and I, I'm going to read, read it one more time because this is what it says. It says in 6 days, verse 9, you shall labor, um, do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. And then here's the rationale. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is within them, and he rested on the seventh day. God is asking for one. I, we, my, we had a family reunion a few years ago. I have a young brother that's a Seventh-day Adventist. And the Seventh-day Adventists, they worship on Saturday, and they call that their Sabbath. But what's interesting about the Seventh-day Adventists is you cannot convince them not to give the seventh day to God. I find it real interesting. We were all, we had plans for our family reunion 
And it was Saturday morning, and my brother's name is Greg, and we all woke up. This was in Texas. Uh, I think it was Austin, somewhere outside Austin. We got up early in the morning, and everybody's like, where's Greg? Guess what Greg did? Greg got a phone book, found a local church, called somebody from the church to come pick him up, and he went to worship and came back and did miss none of the family events. Those of us who call ourselves Christians, we don't think like that because the Sabbath doesn't mean that to us. Depending, now y'all please, please know I love you. Depending on what time the game is. (laughs) And how much we spent on tickets. Hey God, I love you, but. And I'm going to talk about rationale in a little while. The text is challenging us in this way. To seek first the kingdom of God in our worship and then all else. Are you hearing me? So it's not even a matter of saying, because we're going to have situations and circumstances in our life that's going to preclude us from coming to church. I get that. But it's not so much about coming to church as it is about doing God. Does that statement make sense? Getting you and God in the right place. And if circumstances or situations enables you to come to church so much, the better Because I am giving time away for God, so it's just me, and it's all about him. Is this making sense, guys? Okay? So, 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 number one, the Sabbath belongs to God. Number two, we ought to cease all work on the Sabbath to give God his. And the most important things I want you all to get real quick is the third thing I want to share with you, and that is this. We worship God on the Sabbath by thanking him for our redemption. Okay, I know none of you get this yet, but I want you all to track with me. Go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 20. Go here with me. You're going to see these same commands repeated, and then we're going to talk about it in a little while. Deuteronomy chapter 20, and I'm almost done. Deuteronomy chapter 5, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 5, and, and jump down to verse 12. Let me read the same thing from a different perspective so we can see what it's saying. Then I'm going to share with you some things. You guys are there? This is what excites me about the Sabbath. Verse 12. Say amen if you're there. Verse 12 says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. And in same data, six days you shall labor, do all your work. Verse 14, But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do Not do any work, you nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your ox, your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. That your male male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Now look at verse 15. Here's the reason. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord, your God, commands you to keep what? Now, let me paraphrase it, then I'm going to show you two scriptures, and then we're going to end. Listen to this real quick. In six days I made the heaven and the earth, on the seventh day I rested. Here's the deal. Because of what I did for you, I need you now to keep the Sabbath, to give me back mine. Okay. Now, the only reason I want you to keep the Sabbath is I want to sit on my throne in heaven and have you come around, cast off your crown, bow at my feet, and thank me for what I did. Because if you don't think enough of me to thank you, to thank me for what I did, maybe the truth exists that, that you don't know what I did for you. So here's what I did. 400 years, 24-7 work. No break. And then you cry out to me, and I am the one who went to Egypt with a mighty hand and broke that iniquitous cycle, and I'm trying to reinstill something to give you back a day that you lost while in slavery. 
I wonder if you guys are seeing this like I'm seeing this. Come on. Is this making sense to you? Okay? And, and the reason I want y'all to do this is because I am the one who brought you out. So if you don't do nothing else on the Sabbath, you take time to thank me. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. The problem is a lot of us don't know why God brought us out. You kind of get what I'm saying? So let me just walk you through two texts, and then we're going to end on this because I want God to have this way. Go with me to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 and jump down to verse 10. Yeah. Exodus chapter 3, and we'll deal with this a lot more on Wednesday as we talk about about Sabbath because I know you're going to have a lot of questions on what you can and can't do and all that good stuff, um, so on and so forth. So on and so forth. Okay. Y'all ready for this? Okay. Exodus chapter 3, around where do I want to start? Verse 10. Look at verse 10. Say amen if you're there. So this is God commissioning Mary, Pharaoh. I mean Moses to go to Pharaoh. Watch what he said. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now watch this. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh And bring the children of Israel out. Verse 12. God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign for you that I have sent you. Come on, say the sign. Not a sign, but the sign. Are you with me? The article is before it makes it proper. This will be the sign. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall do what? Serve God where? So check this out. That word serve can also be translated, and some of your translation uses this word, worship. Okay? Worship has been taken away from you. I want you all to hear me say this carefully. And for 400 years, you had inhibited worship. You had to sneak out to get one in. You weren't free to do it. And matter of fact, if the pharaohs caught you doing it, it could cost, cost you your life. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send Moses in, and Moses is going to bring you out. And listen how he says it. The sign that you have been brought out, Jesus, is the fact that when you meet me on the mountain, you're going to worship. Now, the reason I like that, because if coming to worship Is not a high priority for people. Maybe you haven't been brought out yet. And there's something that still has you in bondage. Because if I read that text just right. Moses, here's the proof that I'm sending you. Because when the folk come out, they're going to worship me. On the mountain, not that they might, not that they will, but there's going to be a level of freedom. And let me just kind of say it this way because I just can't help myself right about now. If God has done anything for you, if you know who he is that has raised you up and brought you out and give you a new walk and a new talk and a new song and delivered you from that sickness and brought you through the divorce and kept you from bankruptcy, when the doctor said no, he still said yes, it, That overdose and that addiction and that thing that has you bound, if God has brought you out, the sign ought to be your willingness to worship him for who he is. I I want you all to hear me say that. So if, if, if Sabbath is not important, maybe he hadn't brought you out yet. And... Connecting this to the previous text in Exodus chapter 20, the other God might still have you. Because folk that love to worship don't make excuses like, I can worship at home. Because you know when God calls, you respond. Right? Come, I want y'all to hear me, okay? Uh, I, I want us to hear the importance of what God is saying. If I have done anything for you, then the sign is going to be, the proof or the evidence of my work in your life 
is your ability to worship, okay? Whatever worship looks like to you, I'm not saying it's got to look a certain way. Whatever it is, you're going to give God his. Are you hearing me? Let me give you another one, chapter 4. Go to chapter 4 of Exodus. Let me show this with chapter 4, verse 21, and then we're going to stop real quick. Exodus 4, and jump over to verse, yeah, 21. Yeah, 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 this is good. This is good, this is good, this is good. Verse 21, say amen if you're there. Look at what it says in 21. God sending Moses. This is the same, another repetition of pretty much the same thing. And the Lord said to Moses, when you get back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles I've put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus said the Lord, Israel is my what? Firstborn what? Son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may what? Serve me. The same Hebrew context or connotation, he may worship me. If you refuse to let him go, Jesus, behold, I will kill your firstborn. Now, you all know with me quite well that of the ten plagues that God released over Egypt was the battle against the God. It was not until the death of Egypt's or Pharaoh's firstborn that he released the people of God. Here's what this is saying. And, and I want you all to hear the spirit in which I'm saying. This is no different than Matthew chapter 6, verses 33. God says, I brought you out. I gave birth to you. Here's my word. I redeemed you from the pits of hell. Whatever it was that had my people captive, when they gave their heart to me, that's the whole Christocentric thing. I entered their life, and now they're my children. So listen to this. Anything that inhibits the worship of my children, I'm going to deal with it. You, you got to hear the nuance in that. Because if there's something in my life, if there's something in your life, if there's something in our lives that's inhibiting our ability to worship God, you don't have to fight with it. Just worship. God's going to deal with it. I want you to hear me say that. Come on, come on. Just worship. God is going to deal with it. So here's what he said to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, I mean, Moses, I need you to go to Pharaoh and tell him that Israel is my firstborn. And verse 23 says, let my son go that he may worship me. And if you refuse to let him go, I'm going to deal with you. People, Sabbath to God. Here's the last thing. Sabbath belongs to God. It's very, 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 very important. And I want you to hear me say this. That's when we come together to refuel ourselves for the week. Here's what this looked like in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it was a particular day. In the New Testament, after the resurrection of Christ, the day switched from Saturday to Sunday because it patterned the resurrection of our Lord and Jesus Christ. And you can go through the book of Acts and the book of Corinthians, and you're going to see illustrations and examples of the people of God now coming together to worship God on the first day of the week. And that's where that change came because we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. And here's the beauty of grace. Um, Sabbath don't have to necessarily be locked into Sunday or Saturday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. The point of Sabbath is out of seven days, stop one day and give it to God. Are you hearing me this morning? Okay, stop one day and give it to God. Because here's how Mark puts it. He says, man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for man. So in other words, I put this thing in place to make you stop. It's not that you've got to worship the thing. And the problem with a lot of people is they end up worshiping the Sabbath day versus the God of the Sabbath. God just says, I just want to instill a reminder for you to stop every now and then and give me mine because you keep violating curfew. And then when you get ready to go to work, you're not prepared for the game because you haven't stopped so I could feed you. Man, last night about 9 o'clock, got my clothes out, get to ironing. Because I said, I'm not going to get so busy on my Sabbath that the distractions of the world or of home or of life interferes with my worship of God. 
So call me old-fashioned. I think mama and them knew what they were doing. I think, I think mom and them knew what they were doing when they called curfew on Saturday night. Baby, don't stay out that club too long because we got to go to church in the morning. I think mom and them knew when Jimmy would come over, boy, you got to go. We got church in the morning. <laughs> and, and it's in the preparation that we availed ourselves for God. We studied the game plan. We studied the pl plays. We studied everything because we understood that the Sabbath belonged to God such that when we leave worship on Sunday, we are prepared for the world on Monday. Bring it on, enemy. I've spent time with God. And listen to this. God now is going to fight for me. Does this make sense? Let's reverse the process. Let's revert the process and begin the process of understanding belong to God. We ought to get back to the place where on Sundays, church or field, the believers are coming to worship. They're coming to give God his because it's of such a priority because I'm thanking God for redeeming me. I'm thanking God for saving me. I'm thanking God for taking me out of Egypt. I'm thanking God for taking me out of the 24-7 rat race and giving me a chance just to stop long enough to tell him I love him and to tell him I adore him and to tell him who he is for to give me time to ingest him so he can fill me afresh with his spirit so I can go and face the world. Part of pursuing God in worship is giving him back his day. Here's how all of this began. Pastor Karen, come on worship team. I think it was the first Sunday in February when she started the series. She says, if you were to look at the movie um, Concussion, they're bragging about how the NFL has taken from the church a day the church had. And they said this publicly and boldly and confidently. And they're right. Today I'm saying to you, remember the Sabbath. <laughs> right? And don't let nobody take from you the day that God has allocated for you and for me to worship him. Are you hearing me this morning? And I want you to hear me say this clearly. Whatever worship looks like for you, don't let nobody take back, take away from you the day that God has set aside to worship you. 